How will the newly elected president Joe Biden affect the electric car industry here in the United States? We'll compare the campaign promises to the current Trump administration policies and Inside TV's contributor Tom Malogny will be here to talk about what to expect. Tesla's new product sold out so fast that Elon Musk didn't even have a chance to tweet about it. I will explain why Hummer EV prototype has a cord attached to it. Toyota CEO talks smack about Tesla with a weird kitchen analogy. GM reports its surprising Q3 results while NIO passes them in market value after unveiling a new 100 kilowatt hour battery. e bussy reservations climb up, but are they for real? Honda will start paying the price directly to Tesla for falling behind the electric car game. The cheapest EV in America gets a green light to go to market. Their CEO will explain how they did it. And the Volvo Group will electrify the entire truck lineup next year. And their CEO will talk about it as well. All of this is coming up next. Welcome to E4 Electric, your number one source of electric car scoop. If this is your first time here, go ahead and click on that subscribe button and the bell notification icon so you don't miss anything moving forward. Before I get to the top story, I just want to mention that today is the fourth birthday of this channel. It's old enough to wipe its own butt, but not old enough to be able to spell simple five-letter words. I started this YouTube channel as a complimentary service to the Facebook community that I've organized after buying my 2012. That's right, I was one of the first Tesla Model S owners. As a matter of fact, I still have the sun visor from it signed by uh, Elon Musk. And, uh, you know, it was just a 60 seconds per week little newscast and it grew into my full-time job over the last Four years. So thank you to all of you guys who have been watching my channel. Let me know in the comment section how long have you been part of my audience. And speaking of a four-year term, looks like we have a new president-elect. Joe Biden will become our president in January. So let's talk about what he will or will not do for the electric car revolution. By the way, just for the record, I am not a Democrat or a Republican. I'm actually moderate independent. So very much like with electric cars, I will be reporting on this story as an independent and unbiased journalist. So first, let's talk about what the Trump administration has done so far as far as the electric car industry is concerned. Now, let's start with the fact that actually, if it wasn't for the Trump administration, there would be no Lordstown Motors, which now is a publicly traded company, has a factory and does have a working prototype of an all-electric pickup truck endurance. On the other hand, Trump administration pretty much from the very beginning has opposed the California emissions rules and has pushed for EPA to loosen up emission standards, which they did. You can also argue that Trump's tariff war with China probably didn't help the overall American auto manufacturing, but at the same time, it did bring some pain points that I hope will be addressed with the next administration. Now, let's talk about Biden's plan, which I was able to get off of his campaign website. Obviously, these are just campaign promises, but it looks like he is planning on investing about $400 billion in clean energy, which will include a battery technology and electric vehicle technology. He also is planning on investing into the electric grid infrastructure, which I think is a great idea. This is something that we here in California have failed to do, despite the fact that our governor Newsom has basically signed the executive order to ban the sales of gas cars by 2035. He's also planning on investing in about half a million electric vehicle charging outlets by the end of 2030, relaunching the Cash for Clunkers program, which has worked pretty well in the parts of the country where it was implemented. And also he is planning on purchasing fleets of electric vehicles for government transportation. Now, the biggest difference that I think Joe Biden's plan will make if implemented is the restoration of the $7,500 tax credit for all of the manufacturers here in the United States. As you know, right now, Tesla and General Motors are essentially being punished for selling too many electric cars, which means over 200,000 here in the US. And that means that the $7,500 credit is gone for all of their sales. One of the first people who chimed in on this topic was Herbert Diess, the CEO of one of the largest automakers in the world, the Volkswagen Group. 
he essentially said that a democratic president would be more aligned with Volkswagen's electrification strategy. Though I have to say that the upcoming Volkswagen ID4 all-electric SUV will greatly benefit from Tesla's and GM's lack of electric car tax credit. For more, let's turn to Inside EV's contributor Tom Malogny. But before that, a quick reminder that this channel and this video is sponsored by Xpeng Motors, China's leading smart EV automaker that has just launched the world's first all-voice in-car system at its annual Tech Day. For more, follow Xpeng Motors on Facebook using the link in the description of this video. And by Climate Exchange. That's right, the Tesla raffle is back. You can win a Tesla of your choice. Only 4,000 tickets will be sold. So make sure to get yours using the link in the description of this video. And even if you don't win, the money will go towards a great environmental cause. All right, Tom, uh, first of all, uh, really quickly, I don't know if you know, this is the fourth birthday of Electric, and I want to say, you know, thank you so much for being such a big part of it for, you know, now over two years. It's definitely, uh, you've definitely helped me shape this channel. So thank you and happy birthday as well. Yeah, you know, Alex, congratulations. That's a great accomplishment. You've really um, done fantastic things here with this channel. Um, I have to admit that, you know, your first year or so that you were on, I wasn't really watching you that much, became a fan. But as I watched a little more and more, and then as I got to know you personally, I got to appreciate more what you were doing here. And it's it's really my go-to place. It's why I agree to be a contributor. Uh, you do a great job. And congratulations on the four-year anniversary. Thank you. If I can only get my uh, mom to watch my channel as well as much as you do, I would be I would be a happy camper. But we have a big topic to discuss. Um, I'm sure you know all of the facts about both uh, both uh, candidates. Uh, but uh, let me ask you a first question here. You know, now that we it looks like we're going from the Trump uh, Trump administration to Biden administration. What do you see uh, uh, as 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 the biggest change that you expect? Uh, as Biden uh, takes the office for the electric cars. Okay, so, you know, it's pretty clear that Biden has outlined that he's very pro-electric cars and he wants to facilitate the uh, advancement of electrification of our, uh, you know, our uh, 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 small uh, vehicles, I mean, light, light duty vehicles. Um, and what I would like to see personally, what he's already said that he would reinstate Tesla and GM's federal tax credit which is great. It's one of the things I've been trumpeting for a while now. I don't think it's fair that the two um, large U.S. auto manufacturers no longer qualify for this tax credit. It was because they hit that limit. And, you know, back in the Bush era, when this federal EV tax credit was created, they established that each automaker would have 200,000 tax credits. Um, they, you know, they couldn't foresee how the market was going to play out and that we were going to have a couple of companies go so far ahead of the other companies that they, they would get these, the, they would hit that limit years before it was uh, the other manufacturers could. So that's a great first move, reinstate Tesla and GM's tax credit. But we need a tax credit overhaul. That's not good enough. There's a couple of things I'd like to see done and I'd like to explain those to your followers here. First of all, we need to take the federal tax credit and make it a point of sale rebate instead of having something that you claim on your taxes. The, the biggest reason that I'd like to see that happen, Alex, is because some of the people that are less fortunate that don't have as much money can't afford to wait six, seven, eight months to get that money back. They need to have a tax credit at the point of sale. I think that would make it more fair. That's number one. Number two, which might not be uh, very popular with a lot of your followers is I agree there should be some kind of an MSRP cap somewhere around $80,000. I don't think once we get up in that price range, 80, 90, $100,000, you know, somebody's spending $170,000 on a new Lucid Air Dream Edition. They don't really need that $7,500. I'd much rather see it go to somebody who's trying to stretch their budget to buy a Nissan Leaf. Number three, I'm fine with these credits sunsetting at some point. I'd say 2025, but until then, all the manufacturers have unlimited credits. We have an end point five years from now. It ends at that point, but between now and then, sell as many cars as you can. 
we're going to give you the tax credit. The last thing I want to say is right now, the way it's, it, it's structured, you only need a four kilowatt hour battery to, to qualify for the EV tax credit for the base amount, $2,500. That's way too low. That was set back, like I said, in the Bush era. EVs have much bigger batteries now. That's too easy of a target to make. And you max out at 16 kilowatt hours. That's, that's you know, so 10 years ago. I'd like to see us change that. Instead of relying on the size of the battery, we should rely on the EPA range rating. The way I would structure the tax credit was I would give $30 re, uh, rebate for every mile of EPA range rating. So if you have 250 miles, you'd qualify for the full $7,500. If the EV goes 200 miles, it gets $6,000. If it's a, uh, you know, a 30 mile plug-in hybrid, it gets uh, $900. So, um, you know, that's how I would structure it. I think it would make it more fair. I'd love to see a Biden administration take my advice. Now, I should mention, though, that if you are leasing an electric car, this, you don't have to wait for the $7,500 tax rebate because essentially it's the leasing bank uh, that gets it and then pass it to you usually right away. That's one of the reasons that I usually encourage people to lease cars. Um, and yes, I agree there will be some pushback from people, even maybe like myself, especially if it stays as a tax credit that if I'm buying a more expensive car, somehow I, I, I don't get my uh, tax credit back uh, so, but I, I hear you in terms of the tax credit being the, probably the most important thing. Um, all right, but now let's get back to what uh, Trump has done through throughout his four years as a president. You know, I don't think this was much of a priority for him. It doesn't seem like he's done um, that much really uh, uh, for the electric cars, but he did do something that um, probably wouldn't exist without him. And I'm talking about Lordstown Motors. Um, you know, essentially because of the deal that they made with the GM after his, him being angry about GMs abandoning the factories. Um, do you think uh, that this was a move where he realized this was, a, you know, essentially going to promote the electric cars because of the Lordstown Motors essentially going to be all electric brand? Or do you think this was more about uh, not shutting down the, uh, the GM factory? So, yeah, I think that's pretty clear that uh, President Trump um, was just concerned about losing jobs. And, you know, and rightfully so, um, you know, that, that they were going to lose a lot. GM was going to be putting a lot of people out of work. And President Trump didn't like that. And he promised that he wasn't going to allow that to happen when he came in. He wasn't going to allow factories to close. He was going to, in fact, bring back more jobs, invigorate U.S. auto manufacturing. Um, you know, so to see something like that happen on his watch made him upset. And, you know, um, he kind of, you know, I won't say strong armed, but he kind of forced the issue with GM that, listen, this plant better not be idle. Good for him. That was probably a good move. Kept people working. Um, whether or not Lordstown ever produces vehicles, we don't know that yet. But for as far as President Trump's concerned, I don't think he cares if electric cars were made there or ventilators or widgets or whatever. He just cared about the jobs, and uh, and that was a good move on his part. Now let's stay on on the topic of of, of what this administration has done uh, in in the last four years. Uh, one of the things that he brought to the sort of uh, center of attention, uh, you know, definitely when it comes to electric cars, is you know the trade war with China. Um, on one hand, it it highlighted some of the you know issues that we've had right with the much higher tariffs that you know. Uh, China charges on our cars if we were on theirs, but at the same time also created a lot of instability. Uh, it, it, it does look like, uh, you know, Biden will have a different approach, but, you know, do you think that uh, whatever it might be, it will be consistent enough for the brands like Xpeng Motors, you know, one of the sponsors of this channel, um, and Neo, for example, the Chinese car makers who, who do want to do business outside of uh, China, they both go into Europe right now. Do you think uh, because of a, a different approach that Biden administration might have, it will encourage them to bring some of their really great cars? I mean, you drove the P7. I'm super jealous. That's a great car. Do you think they might actually reconsider, uh, you know, doing business with us and, and importing some of these cars in the next few years? So first of all, I'd like to say that um, one of the things that I actually approve of President Trump was that he took on China and said, look, you know, we, we have to do something here. 
I, I maybe don't support some of the things he did. I don't think they were very effective. I think they might have had the opposite effect. But I like the idea that at least, you know, he brought this up and said, we're going to do something to try to make this fair. That said, yes, I agree that a Biden administration will probably bring some more stability in. Uh, whatever happens in the Biden era will be done more diplomatically, more cautiously, will be better planned and better thought out, and hopefully we'll have better results. And if you want to hear more from Tom, which I always do, don't forget to subscribe to his YouTube channel. I put a link in the description of this video. Before we get to the next story, let me address something that I've seen way too much in the comment section of my last Hummer EV in-person review video. And I usually don't do this, but I just saw too many very similar comments that were just too ridiculous to ignore. Some of you have noticed that there was a cord that was plugged into the Hummer EV and a lot of you just lost your mind saying, oh, see, this is vaporware. They're lying to us just like Nikola. And I know we had a very bad experience with Nikola, but this is just how the auto industry works. When an electric car first prototype is unveiled to the media, it's usually not functional. Therefore, you have to plug it in so the lights work, the infotainment system works. So this is pretty normal. I also just talked to Sandy Monroe and I will release that video on Thursday, but he also talked about how he has no doubt that this vehicle will go to market no problem. And by the way, there are plenty of automakers, including Tesla, who have released promo videos that were graphically generated, including this one of the Tesla semi-truck. And by the way, having a fully functioning prototype at the unveiling doesn't mean that the vehicle is going in production right away either. Think of the Tesla Roadster that was unveiled over three years ago. The prototype was fully functioning and very impressive, yet now we're going into 2021 and Tesla still doesn't even have a production date for the Roadster. Now let's stay on topic of Tesla because Tesla has just released a product that sold out almost immediately. It sold out so fast that Elon Musk didn't even have a chance to tweet about it. I'm talking about the Tesla Kila. It started as a joke in 2018 when Elon Musk tweeted an April's full tweet, which you're looking at right now, but so many people wanted Tesla to make this tequila that it is finally here. Well, Tesla is not actually making it. It's actually made by Nosotros. The price tag was $250, but this only proves that Right now, Tesla has a, such a huge brand power that no matter what they make, it's going to be sold out and it's going to be sold out quick. And it was kind of the same back in 2012 when I was buying my first Tesla Model S. I was kind of complaining about having to pay the delivery fee even though I was picking up the car at the factory myself. And their answer was like, hey, listen, if you don't want this car, we have like a bunch of people who will gladly take your spot. And so I did. Now, let's move on to the next story, which actually involves the automaker that's not making electric cars at all right now, outside of China at least. I'm talking about Toyota. The president of Toyota, Akio Toyota, was asked about Tesla recently, and even though he did acknowledge Tesla's success, but he also gave this weird kitchen comparison, essentially saying that Tesla was like a restaurant that's still promoting its recipe, while Toyota was more like a restaurant that's already serving a huge number of customers. Toyota is one of the few automakers that's still not making a fully electric car, just like I mentioned outside of China, where they're being forced to do so. And I do have to say that Toyota does sell a lot of cars, and they do have a full lineup, but you know, Blockbuster used to do very well at some point as well. So I would say that Toyota is more like a restaurant that still allows inside smoking and serves yesterday's soup. Speaking of Tesla's recipe, apparently more and more people like it, specifically the Pride Group Enterprises, a holding company with its main business being truck leasing, announced that it placed a reservation of 150 Tesla semi-trucks with an option to buy 500 total from Tesla. They're buying zero electric trucks from Toyota. Tesla's Cybertruck design update apparently will be revealed in about a month per Elon Musk's tweet. Now, it is true that it does need to be massaged to meet some regulations, specifically in Europe. It's considered to be unsafe for pedestrians. If you remember, I did a story about the Tesla Cybertruck replica out of Europe, where even that replica wasn't really allowed to be on the road specifically for that reason. Of course, it still needs some windshield wipers, the side mirrors, and of course, a lot of people had concerns about the fact that it may not fit in their garage. So we're just going to have to wait and see. 
General Motors has unveiled their third quarter numbers and they were surprisingly good, especially after a horrible second quarter of this year. They've made $4.1 billion in revenues, which is a huge jump from $2.5 billion last year in Q3. A lot of it is credited to the recovery from the pandemic shock, but the real improvements came from the company's profit margin. It jumped from 8.4% last year to 14.9% this year in Q3. GM stock was up on the news, but Chinese-based electric car startup NIO was still able to pass General Motors as a more valuable company based on the market cap at $53.4 billion. NIO stock has risen almost 39% just last week, and it is almost 10 times as valuable now as it started this year. Elon Musk has tweeted out congratulating NIO with a huge success. I'm just kidding. He tweeted out that Tesla is still a much bigger company than NIO, so there. Just in case if you need some help decoding that tweet, you see Tesla stock price was at around $420 last week, which by the way is his favorite number for some reason, even though he's not really a weed smoker. But nevertheless, it was about 10 times bigger than Neo's average price of about $42 per share. See, that's why it's funny and classy. Even though NIO is a publicly traded company here in the United States, they are selling their electric cars in China, though they are also expanding to Europe. NIO has also currently unveiled their new 100 kilowatt hour battery, which is not just going to be available for their new cars, you can actually swap out your current 70 kilowatt hour battery for the new one, of course, for a bit of an extra cost. Also, NIO is the only automaker in the world which has a feature that I think is one of the best electric car features I've ever come across, which is the battery swap. You can go from the fully depleted battery to the fully charged battery in just a matter of few minutes, but also you can swap out the smaller size battery for a bigger size battery or the other way around. I absolutely love this feature and I wish all electric cars would have it in the future. Speaking of swappable car features, let's talk about eBussy, which is a modular electric car that was launched only a few months ago by the electric brands company in Germany. This is the car that you can actually configure anywhere from a pickup truck all the way to a camper. It has a lot of interesting concepts like the drive-by-wire concept allows the steering wheel to be moved from left to right or even in the middle. Not that it's legal in most of the countries. It has two powertrain configurations. One of them is a 10 kilowatt hour battery that's supposed to produce 124 miles in range and costs about $18,000. And the second one is a 30 kilowatt hour battery pack option that will produce 373 miles of range and it will cost $32,000. Here's the problem though. They claim that this car will weigh about 1,300 pounds, which really doesn't add up in terms of the battery pack versus range and even versus price. So, I'm a bit skeptical, though they're saying they're going in production next year and they have over 4,200 reservations, which they proudly display live on their website. Speaking of cars coming to the market soon, Candy Technologies, the parent company of Candy America, one of our sponsors, their shares arose on Wednesday after they've announced that they had received clearance from the EPA to enter the US market. Also, one of their two models, K27, got CARB certification in California as well. K27 is going to be the most affordable electric car in the United States for just under $10,000 after the federal tax credit. It is a city car though. It has a short 59 mile EPA range and the top speed caps out at 63 miles an hour. Candy America will essentially be the first Chinese company to sell passenger cars in the United States. I will let their CEO Johnny Tai explain how they did it. You are going to be the first Chinese-based company to sell passenger cars in the United States. Um, and ahead of other bigger Chinese electric car manufacturers like NIO and Xpeng Motors and uh, BYD and so forth. As a matter of fact, you know, NIO is listed in our New York Stock Exchange and they're not selling any cars yet. Um, why do you think that is and what made you guys, you know, go through all of the hassle of actually coming to America? Because I know that's not a easy logistically uh, to do. Can you talk about that? Well, uh, 
unlike you know when you mentioned Neo, first of all, Candy is also a public you know trade company on Nasdaq, right? And second, you know, unlike other uh, Chinese company, as I mentioned to you earlier, we as the other sports now it's Candy America. We have been here, so we are very familiar with you know uh, how to work with you know local dealership, and then we've been selling. Uh, Offer vehicles, you know, for decades. We talked about Toyota early in this video, but let's talk about another company that's completely refusing to step into the new era of electric cars. And of course, I'm talking about Honda. It will join Fiat Chrysler in paying Tesla for green credits to be compliant in Europe. As I mentioned, Honda has done very little in the EV market and their latest Honda E, though very cute, has a very sad range of only around 110 EPA equivalent miles. Honestly, I don't really like the concept of green credits. I think if an automaker is not making enough of electric cars to satisfy the minimum requirements, they should pay a penalty fee into a fund that will distribute this for a greater EV good, like improving the charging infrastructure or maybe educating the public about electric cars. Volvo Group will electrify its entire fleet of Volvo trucks in Europe and will start selling electric versions of all of their heavy duty trucks starting in 2021. As you remember, I got to drive an all electric Volvo truck in Southern California and that's where I met Volvo Group CEO Martin Lundstedt and we talked about the balance that the newcomers like Tesla bring to the industry that mainly consists of the veterans like the Volvo Group. Do you think it's a good thing for your industry to have somebody come in outside and kind of think outside of the box and push everybody into this? Or do you think it still will be, you know, you know, Volvo Group and others, Daimler and so forth, that will end up setting the tone because uh, these are the industry veterans? I think it will be a combination, basically. I, I think one of the key aspects of our industry, maybe uh, just to compare, I know that you have many of your uh, your audience and viewers also uh, coming from the pest car side, obviously. A and one of the key aspects in our industry is that we are truly B2B. We are selling production equipment. And therefore, obviously, our customers are coming into this with a very strong logic of how does it make economic sense in combination with ecologic and social sense, so to speak, both electromobility, but also autonomous, for example. If you are wondering what to watch next, I strongly recommend my in-person review of the Hummer EV, which I mentioned in the beginning of this video. As a matter of fact, it's kind of a top 10 list of all the hidden and unique features that I found in the vehicle. Also, Sandy Munro makes a quick appearance and gives us his opinion on the Hummer, though the entire interview with Sandy will be published next week. I put the link to that video in the description of this video, or if you're watching me on YouTube, it's right there in that corner. All right, looking forward to all of your comments. Other than that, see you guys next time, and remember to stay charged.